Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the online worship service of Trinity Presbyterian Church. I'm glad that you are uh, able to use this video in your home this morning. Uh, it is still strange not to be able to uh, gather together as the Lord's people on the Lord's Day, but we are thankful for the technology uh, that still allows us to worship together in some way. Uh, if you are worshiping with us for the first time, if you're not a regular at Trinity and you just come across this link or come across this video, we are glad that you are joining us this morning. And if you are willing to let us know uh, that you are worshiping with us, we would appreciate it. Just send uh, an email to uh, jessica at jessica at trinityprescleveland.com uh, and introduce yourself. And if you would like uh, one of the pastors to follow up with you, uh, we would be happy to contact you uh, at some point this week. and. Uh, schedule a time for us to, to talk. Uh, I also have, want to draw your attention to just a few announcements uh, before we get started uh, this morning. Uh, if you'll uh, remember, you saw an email earlier this week saying that uh, the, the session has met and we have decided to cancel all of our activities through Easter Sunday. Uh, the only exception being we're going to have a drive-in sunrise worship service here at the church on uh, Easter morning. Uh, we haven't worked out all of the details for that yet, uh, but we will be uh, sending them out uh, as they are uh, finalized. But we feel uh, like this opportunity to gather, even if we have to stay in our cars, uh, will still be memorable and will still be uh, beneficial for us as uh, the family of God. Uh, also, I want to remind you that our small groups are meeting. They're just meeting online. Uh, and so look for an email with links to the appropriate meetings. And if you've not been a member, of one of our small groups in the past. Uh, we would still love for you to join in uh, to whichever one of these groups uh, is most convenient for you. Uh, they're all meeting online. Uh, just use the login information, to either log in or call in and, and join in uh, that uh, time of uh, fellowship. Also, uh, I want to remind you that we're gonna be having uh, online services on Wednesday as well. Uh, this Wednesday, uh, Carrie Bender has put together a program for the children. Uh, that will be at three o'clock. Uh, so if you have uh, preschool or elementary age children, uh, be looking for that email. Uh, the adults will also be meeting. Uh, we're gonna be staggering the men and the women. So we're not all on at one time, but the men will be meeting at 6.30. I'll be leading a uh, discussion of transformative habits uh, using the book of a common rule. Uh, and uh, Sheila and uh, Kathy will be leading a discussion for the women as well. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, in the email that that will be a study of Ephesians, but we're actually still trying to finalize that. Uh, and so uh, just be, again, looking for the details in your email. Uh, we will try to not over-communicate, but we will try to communicate what you need to know uh, during this unusual time. Uh, so those are my uh, announcements, uh, but we are here uh, this morning to worship, uh, to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. And so let's take a moment now to silently prepare our hearts for worship. People of God, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Hear the call to worship from Psalm 93. The psalmist proclaims, the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O oh Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. The Lord who is our help is the Lord who is mighty, the almighty maker of heaven and earth. And we come into his presence this morning not because we have earned our way here, but because he has invited us. And not only invited us, but he has opened the way through the offering of his own son. God so loved the world that he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. 
This is the love of God for his people. And because he is almighty, it is a love that will never let us go. Let us celebrate this great truth together as we sing, a love that will not let me go. we pray as our brother David prayed long ago. To you, O Lord, we call. Our rock, be not deaf to us, lest if you be silent to us, we become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of our pleas, our pleas for mercy and help, pleas for comfort and provision our plea for your name to be glorified among us. Lord, we cry to you for help and we lift our hands to you, knowing that you always hear us. And you answer graciously for the sake of your son, Jesus, our Lord. And so we bless you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are our strength and our shield. And in you, our hearts are lifted up. Be with us now and receive our worship. We offer it imperfectly, but you receive it in the perfection of Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. We know through human experience that days of peace are fleeting, and we also know that days of trouble can make us feel like the sun won't rise again. And so it's good for us to go back to what we believe, and we're going to do that together this morning using the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, question one. I'll read the question if uh, you'll also read the answer along with me. What is your only 
comfort in life and in death. That I belong body and soul in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all my sins and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil, that he protects me so well that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, that everything must fit his purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. That is what we believe, but as we always confess, we don't always live that way. We don't always live in that comfort. We don't always wholeheartedly live for him. And so here, this call to confess, uh, to confess our sin together from Philippians 2. The word says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. And so let's also confess our sin together and return to the Lord in faith. Again, this is a responsive reading. I'll read both parts for us, but read the part of the people uh, together at home. Let's read together. Let's pray together. Lord God, you have said to do nothing from selfish ambition, but we find selfishness easier than kindness. You have said to do nothing from conceit, but pride remains a powerful motivation in us. You have said to count others more significant than ourselves, but our actions reveal a desire to be God. You have said to look out for the interest of others along with our own, but we are preoccupied with a love of self that evicts our neighbors from our hearts. And yet, Father of mercies, you sent Jesus to wash our feet, to cleanse us by his blood, and to raise us up with him. And so we confess our sin to you and look in faith to our selfless Savior. Take a few moments and confess your sin silently in your own heart. For all who hate our sin and we turn from it, for all who look in faith to the selfless Savior, Jesus, listen as God assures you of his grace toward you in Christ. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Praise be to God. People of God, lift up your hearts. The Lord is for you. He has canceled the handwriting that was against you and that he has made you his own. So let's sing together, Arise, My Soul, Arise.
soul redeeming love His precious blood to bleed His blood atoned for every race His blood atoned for every race His wrinkles now the throne of grace Arise, 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 arise my soul Strongly plead for me Forgive them, oh forgive they cry Forgive them, oh forgive they cry Let that ransom sinner die His pardoning voice I hear He owns me for his child I can no longer fear With confidence I now draw nigh With confidence I now draw nigh Father, Abba, Father, cry Arise, 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 arise my soul part of the service where we collect our tithes, our offerings, and our alms. Obviously this morning we will not be passing a plate as we are not gathered together physically in one place. But we do want to encourage you to use this time to dedicate your gift to the Lord in your heart. You can then send that gift in at a later time. Uh, there's actually three ways that you can do that. Uh, you can uh, mail a check physically to the church. Uh, you can send a payment from your bank, uh, the way you would pay any other bill. Or you can go to our website uh, and you can pay online there through Simple Church. Uh, any one of these ways is acceptable in a way to, to give your gift to the church, to present to God the first fruits of that which he has entrusted to you as a, as a testimony to your faith in him and your belief that all that is yours uh, is yours for the glory of his name and the good of his kingdom. At this time, we would especially ask you to consider making a special gift to the diaconate. Uh, during this season, we are going to have greater than normal diaconal needs uh, as people uh, suffer some of the economic crisis, uh, consequences of this uh, pandemic. And so if you are able uh, to give a special gift to the diaconate this time, uh, we would most appreciate it as our deacons can use that money 
uh, to come to the relief of those who are most in need uh, in this difficult season. So take a moment now to dedicate your gift to the Lord. Let me ask David Borsman now to come forward to offer the prayer of the church. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you and thank you for your sovereign grace and mercy. We thank you that even when the circumstances of our lives are confusing and unexpected, we can count on the absolute perfection of your character and love. Your name is glorious and holy, and we are so grateful for the work that Jesus accomplished on the cross on our behalf so we can be made right before you. We long to see your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven, and we ask that your power would be revealed on this earth to bring healing and redemption for all of us. Restore us, Lord, to the kind of fellowship with you that we were created for, and out of that union with you, make us fit to be at peace with ourselves and love our neighbors and steward the gifts of creation in ways that would bring great glory to your name. We thank you for your work in Trinity Presbyterian Church, and we ask that you would continue to build us up into a structure of living stones to accomplish your will, especially in this season when we are not able to gather together as usual. We also bring before you this morning our petitions. We pray that you would bring us relief from the pandemic that is affecting all of our lives. We ask that you would bring healing to the sick, strength to those who are caring for them, wisdom to those who are making decisions regarding public safety, and patience for all of us as we deal with curtailed activities. We pray for those who are in nursing homes and hospitals who need visitors but are not allowed to have them right now. Help them to understand the circumstances and to experience your comfort. We pray for those who are most vulnerable in our society, for those, for example, who are out of work but cannot afford to miss a single day of work. We pray that you would provide for them. We pray, Father, for Chaplain Sandler and his family. We ask that you would help him to be an effective minister of the gospel to the men and women under his care. Give his family encouragement and grace. Keep them safe and provide for their needs. We pray that you would strengthen marriages in our church and that you would bring healing to physical, emotional, and spiritual wounds. We lift our cares and concerns to you this morning, Lord, and we leave them with you. We ask for your peace that passes understanding to remain upon us. Grant us that we would have the grace to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Scripture reading this morning is going to be Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 through 11. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 through 11. But before we hear the reading of God's word, let us pray and ask for his blessing upon the ministry of his word here this morning. Father, come before you this morning. Acknowledging that your word is that imperishable seed by which we have been born again. And it is the pure spiritual milk by which we grow. And so we ask, Father, that even this morning as we are gathered across the city, that you would be with us and that you would be at work through your word, conforming us more and more to the image of the glory of your Son, that we might live in a manner that is pleasing to you and a blessing to our neighbors. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 through 11. This is the very word of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. This is the reading of God's Word. Earlier this week, I attended an online seminar for pastors, which was designed to help pastors, especially pastors in smaller churches, to develop a 90-day plan, a ministry plan for this unique time, for this time of social distancing and shelter in place. At the very beginning of that seminar, as they were uh, preparing to walk us through some of the steps of the planning, they reminded us that though our circumstances have changed, the call has not. Our call as pastors remains the same. Our call as pastors remains to proclaim him that we might present everyone mature, in him. We are ministers of the word called to, to shepherd God's people towards maturity in Christ and to equip them to live as faithful disciples in, in whatever place God has placed them to the glory of his name. That is our calling. And though our circumstances have changed, the call has not. And I want to begin this morning by reminding you that that's not only true of pastors. Your circumstances have changed, but your call has not. Your call to, to live as a follower of Christ, your, your call to love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself, your, your call to walk in the footsteps of faith, or as the author puts it here in Hebrews chapter 12, the, the call to run the race that has been set before you, it has not changed. We are called to run well regardless of the circumstances. In fact, it's because of the ever-changing circumstances that we are called to run with endurance. You see, the race that the author mentions at the beginning of this chapter, the race that we, we considered last Sunday, that race is the Christian life. As we saw, it's, it's not some secret plan that God has for your life that you're supposed to be deciphering like some spiritual Sherlock Holmes. You're, you're not trying to, to follow the breadcrumbs or figure out the clues to determine exactly what it is that God would have you to do or to, to not do in any given situation. Rather, the race that is set before you are the unique opportunities that God has given you to bring glory to his name by loving your neighbor well. And yes, those opportunities look differently in our present circumstances. You can't do the things that you normally do. You, you can't continue to love neighbor the way that you have in the past. But the call to love your neighbor has not changed. That is the race that is set before you. 
And regardless of whether we are under shelter in place or, or whether we are living under more normal circumstances, that race is hard. It was hard before the novel coronavirus, and it is hard now under this pandemic. It's hard. It's a, it's a hard race to run. And we, we considered some of the reasons why that race is hard last Sunday. It's, it's hard because it, it goes against the, the nature of our flesh. It goes against the, the flow of the world. And it goes against the deceitful tactics of our enemy, the devil. It is a hard race to run. And the author knows it is hard. He knows that the calling that we have received is not easy. And so therefore, in this paragraph before us this morning, he gives us three encouragements, three helps that we might run this race well. First, he says, we must consider Jesus. We must consider Jesus and his suffering. Second, we must consider our own suffering. And third, we must consider the Father's purpose in our suffering. So I want us to look at each of these three helps this morning. First, we must consider him. We must consider the suffering of Jesus. The author says that, that he suffered great hostility from sinners against himself. Last week, we, we saw that, that Jesus is the author and perfecter of faith. He is the one who, who walked the road of faith before us, and he is the one who walked it all the way to its conclusion. He is the pioneer who finished the course. And because he is the pioneer who, who finished the course, we know, we know that we have a Savior. Because having finished the course, he was exalted to the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He is now enthroned in heaven. He now sits at his Father's right hand. This is what we know about Jesus. But consider the suffering that he had to endure before his exaltation. Consider the suffering that he underwent while he was here on earth. He came to his own and his own rejected him. We know that suffering. We, we know the suffering of rejection. Jesus suffered that. We know the, the, the suffering of slander. Jesus was slandered. He was opposed. And ultimately, he was betrayed. He was beaten. He was unjustly condemned. And he was crucified. We are familiar with the, the story of his passion. We are familiar with the, the story of his suffering. Jesus suffered greatly at the hands of lawless men. Jesus suffered under sinners. And yet, despite all of his Suffering, or maybe we should say because of all his suffering, because he endured even to the end, because he did not turn to the right or to the left, because he ran the course that was marked out for him, because he submitted to his Father's will, he was exalted and now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. And that is precisely what the author wants the Hebrews to see. It's what, it's what he wants us to see. He wants us to see that Jesus now sits in heaven at the right hand of the majesty on high. And he wants us to see this because it reminds us that our present suffering cannot annul God's promise to give us the kingdom. Jesus entered into glory through suffering. Suffering was his course. And if suffering was his course, then we can know that the suffering we now endure cannot undo his purpose. It cannot negate God's promise. It cannot separate us from his love. But of course, the question remains, how do we know 
but Jesus sits at the Father's right hand. How do we know that, that he who suffered has now been exalted? Well, if you remember, this is exactly where the book of Hebrews began. Just flip back with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Flip back to the very beginning of this book. You remember that the author begins long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom he also created the world. He begins by, by reminding us that God has spoken of the son and he has spoken through the son. And he goes on to say that his ministry is far superior to that of angels. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. He says, let all the angels worship him. His angels, they are ministers of a, a fire. But the son, to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And on and on the author goes. He reminds us that, that God spoke of the Son even before he came. And he told us that he would be exalted. God told us what he was going to do. And not only has God told us what he was going to do for his Son, but he has also given us prophets and, and apostles to testify to what he has done. We, we see this in, in chapter 2. Going on, the, the author says, Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away for it. And then he says this, For how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord himself, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And so not only did God tell us through the Old Testament prophets what he would do for his son, but he has told us through the New Testament apostles and, and prophets who were, who were publicly validated by the miracles worked through them by the Spirit. He has told us what he has done. And so we have the testimony of, of the Old Testament prophets and the testimony of the, the New Testament apostles that tell us that Jesus Christ is indeed the incarnate Lord, who suffered and died and rose again, ascending to heaven, and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. We have this testimony confirmed by the power of the Holy Spirit, and so we may be certain, we may know with absolute assurance that Jesus now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. And if the Jesus who sits at the right hand of the throne of God suffered such hostility from sinners, then we must not grow weary when we suffer similarly. Consider Jesus. He suffered. He suffered greatly. And yet he is now enthroned in heaven. How much more? Will the Father bring us to glory with him if we rest in his good work on our behalf? Especially when you consider that the suffering that we face is far less severe. This is the second help that the author gives us this morning. First, he wants us to consider Jesus. He wants us to consider his suffering. But he also wants us to consider our own suffering. We, we see this in verse 4. He says to the Hebrews, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Now, earlier in chapter 10, the author acknowledged that the Hebrews had endured a hard struggle. They, they had suffered, and they had suffered quite a bit. We're, we're told that they had been publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and, and had been partners with those so treated. We're, we're told that they had been in prison. We're, we're told that they had had their property plundered. Their, their suffering was real. But they had not yet shed blood, which seems to be a euphemism here for, for death. They had not yet given their life. This is what the author wants them to, to see. 
Their suffering is real, but it does not compare with the suffering of Christ, who suffered even to the point of death on a cross. But again, we ask, how does that help? How is that an encouragement? How, how does being reminded that we have not yet lost our lives strengthen us to run with endurance? Well, the idea seems to be that uh, the, the author wants them to see that their suffering is still well within the limits of what is worth it. Jesus considered the cross and the shame of the cross and the, the suffering of the cross as nothing compared to the joy that was set before him. For the joy that was set before him, he despised the shame of the cross. But the suffering that has been set before us falls short of that which was set before Christ, because Christ suffered not only physically, but he actually drank the, the full cup of God's wrath against sinners. What we have been called to is far less. We have suffered, yes, and, and we will continue to suffer. But we have not suffered as Jesus suffered. We have not even suffered as that great cloud that surrounds us has suffered. We suffer, but our suffering is well within the limits of what is worth it. The author is gently rebuking the Hebrews for, for thinking that their suffering is too much, that their, their suffering is, is somehow greater than the promised reward. He says, consider your suffering more accurately. Even if you had suffered to the point of shedding blood, even if you had suffered to the point of, of death, it would be worth it. How much more is the, the slight and momentary affliction that you are now facing? Jesus once said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but, but loses his soul? A man can, can gain every treasure. He can experience every pleasure. He can gain the whole world. But if he loses his soul, it is a terrible bargain. It is all for naught. Well, here, in a sense, the author has given us the other side of the coin. He is saying, what does it cost a man if he gains his soul but loses the world? What is your suffering compared to the reward? What is your suffering compared to the inheritance that is yours in the coming kingdom of God? What is your suffering compared to the eternal weight of glory that is being prepared for you? This is the, the mindset that Luther expresses in his great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, when he, when he proclaims, Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. What does it cost me if they, they take goods and kindred? What does it cost me even if they take this mortal life his kingdom is forever and if i am in him his kingdom is mine that is what the author wants the hebrews to see he, he wants them to see their suffering from the perspective of jesus victory of jesus accomplishment that accomplishment was secured for them an inheritance in the coming kingdom of God. So let me ask you this morning, how do you think about your own suffering? How do you measure it? Do you measure it against the reward? Do you measure your suffering against the eternal weight of glory that is being prepared for you? Can you say with Paul, I suffer the loss of all things and count them as nothing compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection? Or do you see your suffering only from the perspective of the here and now? I don't mean to suggest that our suffering is 
nothing. I don't mean to suggest that the, the loneliness and the isolation and the inconvenience that we are experiencing now, that the, the, the financial hardships, that the, the physical hardships that we experience not only during something like this pandemic, but really all the time. I don't, I don't mean to suggest that they are nothing. They are real. Our suffering does not compare with the eternal weight of glory that is being prepared for us. And that's key. It is being prepared for us even by these sufferings. That is the, uh, the author's third point here. That is his third encouragement. First, he has, he has called upon us to see Jesus the one who suffered greatly, now seated at the right hand of the Father on high. And he has called us to, to second see our own suffering as, as slight and momentary compared to that glory which will be ours in the age to come. But finally, he wants us to see that it's not just that we can endure the suffering because there is light at the end of the tunnel. He wants us to see that God is actually using the suffering to bring us into glory. In our suffering, we are being disciplined as sons. Notice what he says. He says, have you forgotten the exhortation? The, the NIV says the, the word of encouragement. Have you forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons or as, as children of God? He's, he's referring to Proverbs chapter 3. That's the word of encouragement that he has in mind. He, he quotes it for us here in the text. He says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Now to hear this as a word of encouragement... We need to distinguish between punishment and discipline. Punishment is retribution. Punishment is a, is a way to even the score, to, to pay a debt. Punishment is, is what you give to one who is not forgiven. They have to pay their debt to society or they have to pay their debt to heaven. Well, as children of God, we need to know that our punishment has been paid in full. There is now no punishment for the children of God. The record of, of debt that, that stood against us, that record was nailed to the cross. And it has been canceled. It has been paid in full. We do not stand before God needing to deal with our sin. It has been dealt with once and for all through Jesus' sacrifice of himself. And yet, there is still discipline. Discipline for children, not punishment, but a, a discipline that is corrective, a, a discipline that is transformative, a discipline that, that, that shapes us into who we want to be. We live in a day when self-discipline, if not often practiced, is at least often praised. People want to be self-disciplined. They, they want to be the, the kind of people who can shape themselves. But often, it is a discipline that comes from the outside, that is more effective. We, we suffer because God is disciplining us. He is the Father who is shaping us. He, he tells us that, that earthly fathers do this. Earthly fathers discipline their, their children. Earth, earthly fathers discipline as they seem best. They, they do what they think is in the best interest of their children, and we respect them for it. But God disciplines in his perfect wisdom. He disciplines always for our good because he sees it all. He knows it all. And he knows what will bring about the end that he desires. 
And therefore, the author says, we must endure our suffering as discipline, as an instrument in our loving Father's hands. Because when we endure his discipline, it has its full effect. If when the discipline comes, we turn to the right or we turn to the left, we, we do not benefit from it. But if we endure, the discipline becomes discipline indeed. And by that discipline, we come to to participate in his holiness. By that discipline, we reap the, the harvest of peaceful fruit that comes from righteousness. And there is no greater reward than righteousness. There is no greater reward than, than holiness. The, the treasures and the pleasures of this life ultimately prove empty without character. But those who are conformed to the image of Christ they know joy regardless of their circumstances. And so our Father is fitting us to glorify and enjoy God for all eternity. And he is preparing us for that even now as he shapes us by our suffering. So this morning we have heard three encouragements, three, three helps to run well the race that has been set before us. We've been encouraged to, to see the greatness of the suffering of the one who now sits at the right hand of the Father. So that we might recognize that our present suffering cannot keep us from glory. And we've been encouraged to, to see the smallness of our own suffering compared to his. So that we might recognize that, that whatever it is we are suffering, it is well worth it when contrasted with the reward that is held out to us. And we have been encouraged to see that that suffering is not only worth it, but it is actually moving us towards the reward. It is discipline from our Father. It is the tool in his hand by which he is shaping us more and more into the image of the glory of Christ. It is with these lenses that we must see and, and regard our suffering. So let me ask you, how will you make use of these encouragements this week? You will suffer, some of you more than others, but, but we will suffer in the brokenness of this present evil age. How will you make sense of your suffering? I charge you to, to heed the words of the author, to consider him. To consider your own suffering and to consider the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons, that he is at work for your good. Because it is knowing that, it is knowing that, that all things, especially our trials, work together for our good. It is, it is knowing this that sets us free to hear it as a word of encouragement and to call it good news. Do you believe that? Amen. Let us believe it together. Father God, we do come before you now, humbly asking that you would, that you would be with us in our trials, and that you would use them according to your wisdom for our good, that we might be conformed to the image of your holiness, that might receive the peaceful fruit of righteousness all to the praise of your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final song this morning is a song that might be uh, new to some of you. Uh, it is a song uh, by the Gettys titled, When Trials Come. We encourage you to sing it this morning as a testimony of your faith in the promises of God to bring you through every trial in to glory. Let us sing together when trials come.
God, receive now your Lord's blessing. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go now in this blessing to be a blessing in the city.